I am Ashley Zahorian with CMAX Media. We care about how people integrate their faith in their work. And we get to talk with Amanda Lahr today, who we have met at CMN over the years, the Catholic Marketing Network. And my kids have read some of her books. I've read some of her books. Uh, and she is a friend of ours here at CMAX. So greetings, Amanda. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity here. Awesome. And you have been a, a busy beaver writing away. And we want to talk specifically today about the book that you have coming out in October, um, October 2nd, I believe. So tell us about the book. Okay, the story is called Royal and Ancient. And it's a time travel set in the year 1691 in the Highlands in Scotland. So basically, we have a 17 year old girl working in a golf course in the United States. It's the day before she and her dad are set to move across the country. He's in the Air Force, and she's had multiple moves in her lifetime. He's a single parent. She's an only child, so it's just the two of them. And she gets struck by lightning that day, and she wakes up on the 17th green of the oldest golf course in the world, which is Royal St. Andrews in Scotland, surrounded by a group of men, one of whom happens to be a, a very attractive man young man just a couple years older than her and his father is actually the leader of the mcdonald clan in scotland in the highlands and uh, yeah you get to see the adventures of her adjusting to life in the 1600s and negotiating you know her feelings with this young man and he going through the same thing with her and the political things that were going on in those years, particularly the persecution of practicing Catholics. And she was born and raised Catholic, and he and his family are still practicing the faith, but they're doing it underground, in essence, to avoid being caught by the British troops. Really interesting. And uh, something that fascinates me is just the way people live their faith, especially under pressure. Um, mm -hmm. With this being historical based fiction, tell me about the research you did of how people were coping with persecution in that time. Yeah, it was it's a crazy amount of research to write books that are set, you know, hundreds of years ago in, in another country and another part of the world. It's it's interesting because if I end up with like a 250 page book, I usually have about 125 pages of documents of notes that I've gone through and read line by line as I'm researching life in various ages. And you were asking about, um, can you repeat that again? You were saying about uh, the religion part. Yeah. How did they cope with persecution, the persecution you were talking about where they were underground of living their faith? Well, there were several ways that people did things. They either signed an oath to Britain or England saying that they would follow the Church of England. And sometimes they did it truthfully, and sometimes they did it knowing that they weren't actually committed to that. Other people were practicing the faith, but they were doing it clandestine, basically. So there were priests who had fled the country and snuck back into Scotland to, you know, do the sacraments and such, but they were underground, basically. So they were hidden. Um, if you were found harboring a priest or a monk, then that usually didn't turn out well for you. Um, a lot of people were basically put to death with things like that. And a lot of people actually fled the country People, especially young men who were intent on going into the priesthood, they went to other countries like France to study for the priesthood because all the monasteries and seminaries were shut down in Scotland. Um, how about for her, for your, your heroine in this book? Well, the interesting thing, her name is Bronwyn and the young man she meets is Ian. But Bronwyn is a cradle Catholic and had gone to Catholic schools all the way through grade school. And she she never really had given any thought to persecution of people of other religions because she was in the United States. That wasn't an issue here. And so her eyes were so open because even when the first time she mentioned to Ian that she was Catholic, I mean, he's basically trying to quiet her so no one can hear what she's saying. She had no idea she was putting her life at risk by even mentioning that she was a practicing Catholic. And so when she does actually go to these underground masses, in essence, with his family, she really begins to appreciate 
the beauty of their faith and and how deep it is and how meaningful it is. And she has kind of a conversion, you would say, where she really begins to understand, you know, the true presence of Jesus in the body and blood, you know, the, the wine and the bread, and really how this was the the faith basically that Christ initiated when he was on this earth. And so it really changes her in that way. If nothing else, that was, I guess you'd say worth the trip, even though she didn't choose to travel through time to go there, but it was significant in her life. Gotcha. What inspired you to write this book? Um, well, to start, I always wanted to write a book. I was a journalist for years and I started out writing historic fiction because I, I always loved historic fiction romances and they were always like the ones that I was reading were bodice rippers, they call them. So they're not clean romances. I wanted to write romances that were clean and inspiring stories that my kids and my grandkids would read someday. And I was inspired to write this book. I mean, I started it like 10 years ago. It's been a long time in the making, but it kept getting pushed out to the back burner because I have a Civil War series that I was working on. And for some reason, I was always drawn to Scotland and to things Scottish. I love bagpipe music. I love the kilts on the guys. I love the Highlands. It's so beautiful. And I, I never, I just thought, well, it's just one of those people. But the interesting thing was, I knew that half of me, half of my DNA is, is Irish because my dad's mom and dad are, were born in Ireland or from Ireland. And so, but I never knew what the other half of me was because my mom had never met her birth father. And through Ancestry.com, basically we, we got her DNA and we realized that her birth father was basically half English and half Scottish. My grandpa was Scottish, the grandpa I never met. And so that was just affirmed or confirmed that that I was meant to write this book. And everything is done in God's timing, because if I had not known that 10 years ago when I started writing this book, if I had written it then, I don't think it's a book that it wouldn't be the book that it is today. I think that it's so much richer because this means so much to me. And like you said, I did a ton of research, but it was just so interesting for me to learn this. And I think readers will find this interesting. I always try like when I write, I try to do a little bit of teaching, not a hard sell, but just enough so people can kind of get the facts of how life was in different various centuries. What did you learn the most through doing this? How were you challenged to grow the most either spiritually or just things that you learned other than your family history? Yeah. Well, I just learned a lot about life in Scotland in general. It's amazing. You look at back in the day, the, the women were generally housewives and mothers, but oh my gosh, their lives were so detailed. They could do so many things that modern American women mm -hmm. cannot do. Their skill set is amazing. And I know we can all do cell phones and, you know, we have access to so much information. They didn't have access to that. And I learned about, you know, giving birth in those days, oh my gosh, it's kind of a scary thought, which is part of the book, <laughs> you'll, you'll discover. And I learned about the church and the various uh, ways the mass was done and how people participated and who could, who could get the, um, who could get the, the body and blood of Christ and how often those things were done and how liturgical holidays were celebrated. It's really, really interesting. So yeah, overall, I, I learned a lot. And not only that, it's just about the, the politics at the time. I learned about the kings and the queens and the, the wars and the massacres. The Glencoe Massacre is highly featured in this book, something I had never heard of it until I ran across it. And as I was researching before I started the real full book, you know, like a year or so ago, once I heard about the Glencoe Massacre, I'm like, that, that has to be part of this book. The book has to be set in that era because it's, it was so critical. And to this day, they're not exactly sure what happened, but in essence, the, the leaders of the McDonald clan were slain by another, either by another clan or by English forces because they were caught practicing the faith, the Catholic faith. Um, how hard is it to read about, to do research on a massacre and then incorporate it into a book of something so um, 
awful. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I should mention, you know, of course the massacre is in the story, but the story has a lot of, it's a lot of fun moments. There's romance. It's a sweet romance. There's a lot of friction between her and our leading man because, you know, they have different ways of looking at the world. But as far as the Glencoe massacre, it was interesting researching it because no one to this day knows who reported the McDonald clan. And so there's controversy. So you read a lot of different versions of this and what went down that whole winter day back in 1692. And I don't know, it was, it was interesting. Just the fact that it even happened was kind of crazy when you think about it, like literally slaying people because they're practicing their faith. Like, not that it was affecting anybody else. It really meant nothing. But I think because they were, they hadn't signed an oath to the King of England, that was probably the major factor there. But yeah, it was just, just interesting learning about it and, and learning more about Scotland, particularly since it's my grandfather's, you know, heritage. I love learning about the past. Uh, who is the target market for this book? What's the audience? Well, it's YA, so young adult. So I would say high school and above. So all the way up, I have readers in their 80s and their 90s who love my books. And I have a lot of um, teens, boys and girls that love the books. Um, particularly, I noted a lot of homeschool kids love my books. And I think part of that is, is I challenge people when I write. I remember back in the day when I first started writing for the newspapers, I believe in my training, I was told that we were supposed to write at an eighth grade level. Well, when it came time to write books, I'm like, nope, I'm not doing that. I'm going to challenge mm -hmm. my readers. I want them to to learn new words and learn new facts and uh, learn history mm -hmm. from a little different perspective from what they might be getting at this moment. So there, yeah. Well, how does your faith mm -hmm. inform you as a writer? Oh my gosh. It's funny because I call myself you know, a Christian writer or a Catholic writer, or sometimes you have to say Catholic Christian, people want it like that way, but my faith is everything. The reason I'm writing Catholic fiction is because that's what I know. I was born and raised Catholic. I've never stepped away from the church. I've never doubted the church. Sometimes, of course, there's doubts about leaders and people in charge, but the church itself, I've always had complete faith in the church. And this is just everything, every aspect of the books, like when you when your characters have character arcs and they're becoming better versions of themselves, that's such a Catholic thing to say. Every day I want to be a better version of myself. That's what I want my characters to go through. And I want to just mm -hmm. show what Catholicism is like on a day-to-day -day basis, how Catholics should be striving to live their lives. I want people to... Sometimes I joke mm. with people, like, people are always saying to me, oh, you're so nice. I'm like, my whole life, people said, oh, she's so nice. That's mm. kind of seemed like a bland word. And I thought, you know what? I'm totally fine with being nice. I'm glad that people label me as mm. nice. And it's like, I want people to look at me and see the joy in my face and go, she must be Catholic. Mm. You can tell. Look at the joy. She exudes joy everywhere. And that's so true. Every day I try to do some little thing mm. for some person that's extra nice, that will make their day. And there's so many opportunities, mm. whether you're out and about at stores or whether you, you're sending a text or on Facebook or on Twitter or what have you. That's what I want to, to show people, that there's so much joy in being Catholic and we should all have this attitude so people can spot us everywhere. I love that. The the film we made, The Preacher to the Popes, um, about Raniero Canela Mesa, you know, he's the preacher of the papal household. He's been there for the longest in history since 1980. And I got to spend some time with him making that. And the thing that mattered more than anything else was joy. Um, mm -hmm. The joy that reflects from him is really his secret sauce. And I think yeah. that should be the secret sauce for everyone. Um, he said something that hit me that, uh, you know, joy cuts across generational lines wow. um, you know because it does joy is yeah. infectious and there is a language that is um still authentic and believed and that's the language of joy you know you can put on a front and have you know all of the words to say and have great theology and great reasoning and logic um and great morals but if you don't have joy 
So what? Right, exactly. Back to the book. That was the reason we scheduled talking about things. Um, if somebody wants to read this, how do they find it? Uh, you Probably the easiest way is to go to amandalauer.com. There'll be a link on there. Or chrismpress.com. Or Amazon, the typical. And I believe it might be going on Barnes & Noble, but I'll have to check on that. But for sure, just go to amandalauer.com. That's my my website and all my books are connected there and actually you can see all my books on there if you like civil war i've got an entire series the fifth book in my civil war series comes out november 1st this year so it's a busy time of the year a busy time busy season in my life and the sixth book in that series i'm working on right now and then i have a book set in the court of king henry the eighth that comes out september 1st 2024 so i'm just you know plugging away working you know, you ha I always say you have to make hay while the sun shines and God has been shining his sun on me and you can spell it S-U-N or S-O-N for quite a while. And I just really feel like he's given me this talent. He's given me this voice. And I want to get these stories out to literally to millions of people worldwide. And hopefully someday one or two or more of them will be made into movies or series to really have a greater reach in this world because they have such great messages about redemption, about God's love, about faith, about family, just all the real basics of life and things to strive for in our lives. I definitely agree with that. And we'd love to see some of them made into movies and shows too. Uh, well, Amanda, thank you so much for um, taking some time to talk with me today. And we look um, forward to the release of all of your books in the coming uh, months and years. Uh, thank you for sharing your talents with the world. Oh, for sure. And thank you for having me on. I really appreciate talking to you again. Awesome. Thanks, Amanda.